Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us on Forgotten Feminists. Forgotten Feminists is sponsored by The Spectator. As the longest running magazine in the world, The Spectator believes that journalism must be witty and insightful, that ideas should be discussed without the constant threat of cancellation. The Spectator never confuses the serious with the dull. It isn't right wing, it isn't left wing. It believes in challenging, informing, and entertaining readers. Since its foundation in 1828, its mission has been to convey intelligence, not ideology. Sign up today and you'll receive three free months of both the print and digital magazine, plus a free spectator hat. Just use the offer code Yasmin at checkout to redeem the special offer just for listeners of Forgotten Feminists. Thanks again. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Forgotten Feminists with one of my favorite people, Rada Mrs. Mrs. No. Rada, <laughs> Mrs. Rada Ziegler. Am I pronouncing that correctly? It's Ziegler, but Ziegler. Um, a lot of people call him Ziegler, so it's, I guess. <laughs> I will say it correctly. Ziegler. Um, welcome, welcome, Mrs. Rada Ziegler. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, thank you so much for having me. This is fun. I get to talk to you. I love you. So this is amazing. <laughs> I love you more. I am so, so excited to share your story with everyone. We've had an overwhelming response to your posts about this. Um, I'm, I'm not surprised because your wedding dress is absolutely gorgeous. So that's gonna catch people's <laughs> attention. Um, but also just your story because people know what it's like for women in Saudi Arabia, right? It's yeah. part of popular culture. Um, somebody just recently sent me this video with Kevin Hart and Snoop Dogg where they were both like too scared to say anything about Saudi Arabia. And it's like this really funny clip where they're both like, dude, I'm not saying shit. Like, I'm not gonna even look at the camera. I'm not gonna look at the screen. Like just, get, you know. I'm it's not, such I'm like, a taboo topic. It's like anything related to Saudi Arabia, especially now with MBS is like trying to, you know, be progressive and, you know, um, allowing women to drive and allowing women to work and allow, women to get into universities like uh, the King Fahd University for um, you know, the, the engineering university that is there because there was no graduated um, high school I ever wanted to study and now women are finally able to register and attend that university. Yeah. But unfortunately it's not, it's Every time you criticize Saudi Arabia, it's like, oh, you're stuck in the past. I was like, yes, yeah. but those are not things that you can just gloss over and forget about. Yeah. Um, well, let's just talk about the past a little bit for a minute. Let's take it back to your past. Um, tell me what it was like for little Rada growing up in Saudi Arabia. So you were part of a minority community, correct? Yes, so I'm uh, originally, you know, from the Eastern province, um, Al Hassa, and uh, I didn't really grow up in Al Hassa because both my parents worked in Bahrain. Um, so I grew up there, but my family are all Shia. They're very religious Shia, they're very fundamentalist Shia. And the way they, they interact with each other is, is that all of us have to be at the same religiosity, like religious level we all need to look a certain way. We all need to present ourselves a certain way. And if you don't, then, well, you're garbage and now you're not one of us. And uh, they go out of the way also to um, attack you for, for leaving or becoming somebody different. But it must go back to little me, you know, growing up, I'm the oldest of four. I have three younger brothers. Um, I, well, my love very, very much. And when I was younger, the way, this is how religious my family were. Instead of, you know, the way, um, you know, mothers go and, you know, tuck, their, tuck, tuck in their kids, you give them a kiss good night or give them a nice, you know, story, uh, maybe Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Nope, mine were biblical stories. Mm. Um, stories, you know, from the Quran, stories from um, biblical traditions, you know, Noah, Adam, uh, Moses, all of those stories. And uh, Moses was the, lo the longest, obviously, because he goes through so much. And 
uh, in addition to that, of course, I would read, uh, you know, Surat al-Fatiha, Surat al-Akhlas, the Ma'awidat, Ayat al-Kursi, every night before going to bed. And then I get to be asked by my mother the uh, questions I would be asked before going, you know, after, uh, you know, when you're dead and you're buried, the, uh, the questions, you know, who is your God? What is your religion? Who is your prophet? And uh, who is your imam? Because, you know, we're Shia. And I would have to recite all 12 imams in the right order. And that was every single night until I, uh, my mother was, uh, you know, I, I was too old to be put to bed. So that's, uh, you know, she would do that at for, nine years old. And she would do uh, that with all four of you guys? Like, that was a, that's a busy night. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, she only did it with me. She never did it with my oh, brothers. And then she was, uh, she was like, I should have done it with your brothers too. Look at you, yours. You know, you know everything. And uh, once I left, she was like, you don't know anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then it's like, yeah, yeah. So you just flipped so immediately, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, but I mean, it's, it's, the way I grew up was just so bizarre now that I'm thinking about it after meeting so many people here. It's like, oh, you didn't grow up like this? Yeah. You know, the um, people don't seem to understand when you're nine years old, you're still a child. Yeah. And when you put a hijab on a child, you yeah. are essentially telling them that now you're an adult and everything that you do is, hey, you know, mm -hmm. I can't go running around because then um, what if like my ankle shows or I fall and my shirt rides up or, um, you know, that's not ladylike, you know, don't sit like this. Don't talk like this. Don't do this. Don't do that. Everything's so restrictive. And that's essentially how I grew up. Mm -hmm. And riding a bike it's, or swimming or any sports. No, I life? never learned how to swim. I still don't know how to swim and it still is a very sore like subject for me because I would love to learn, but it's just such a scary thing for me mm. because you know, I'm in my thirties. Usually people learn when they're children. I have the exact same issue. My husband is like, you need to learn how to swim, you know, <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> <just> the same <laughs> thing. <laughs> but I, he's tried to teach me and I've almost drowned him because I freak out as soon as my feet are not touching solid ground. And I, you know, it, it's, I guess we're, I, I could eventually get over it. I mean, I did learn how to ride a bike. Same, <laughs> same. <laughs> Look at us grown adults excited that we can do things that children take for granted. Oh, yeah. Like they don't even think about this as a, as a right or as a privilege. You know, we no. see those videos of women in Iran getting imprisoned for riding bicycles. And you think like, people don't even think of that as a privilege. They just think of it as just a normal part of everyday life. But for us, it's like, there's a whole, there's a Saudi movie about a girl wanting to ride a bike. Yeah. Wajda by a Saudi a Arabian movie. I love that such movie. Really great movie. But I mean, it's such a point of contention that you can actually make a two hour movie about the fact that a girl wants to ride a bike. Like that would never happen in the western world you know like our the most basic things for other people are such huge obstacles for us um and, and um to add to what you were saying like you know in iran you know women are being um you know imprisoned and maybe in saudi that doesn't exactly happen everything in saudi is behind closed doors it's when it comes to saudi arabia it really is dependent on who your family is and who they know Mm -hmm. it's uh, it's almost not even uh, it's 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 all class like if you're a rich person that has ties to the royal family you live a great life you're you're known to be liberal you're traveling to Europe every year every summer you go to the best schools you uh you never ask for anything and then once you graduate the best colleges you go back and you uh you immediately start a, a business and then you're known as like this businesswoman and look at me and look what I'm able to do. Uh, women, Saudi women aren't oppressed. Look what I can do. Yeah. And then yeah. you go a little deeper and you go to houses, um, not even like mine. Mine are were considered to be liberal, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. But like if you go to um, the villages where, uh, you know, girls don't even finish high school, mm -hmm. even boys don't finish high school. They just marry them off, have children, and that's it. You don't like... I remember I spoke with another, um, an, a guy um, from 
uh, from Al-Hasa. And he was so mesmerized by the fact that my family allows me to go and study instead of just get married. Uh, he was one of the first people in his family to even get a, a passport. And when he got a passport, his father called him all sorts of names, thinking like, oh, now you're going to go and, uh, you know, get into, uh, you know, what they call a dara, like prostitution or um, uh, drinking and doing all sorts of, uh, you know, haram things. And to him, women and his family are like, by the time they're 16, they're already married. And in my family, a lot of the girls get engaged at 13, 14, married off during college or uh, right out of high school. I've been to so many weddings for girls that are like 16, 17. And I am just like, how is this okay? And everybody's celebrating and everybody's happy. To me, for the longest time, and this, um, and this will bleed into a little bit and, and through how I got, you know, and now I'm married and I'm happy. But I've always looked at marriage, you know, uh, and or relationships as a doom. Like, yes, I've never Prison. seen a happy. Uh, mm -hmm. My parents were not happy. In a lot of cases, it seems more of an obligation than anything else, or mm -hmm. they're just there to have kids. And it also made me feel like children are just a burden. Like they're not, mm -hmm. they're, 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 why have kids if this is what you know, parenting is this. Why have why be married if this is what marriage is like? And when I left, and I came, and not before, even before I left, when I was you know looking for love because I refused to get married the traditional way. There was no way that I was going to marry somebody that my parents approved of. You mean somebody that was just going to be my jailer? No. And in a lot of cases in Saudi Arabia, women are not able to leave the house unless they get married. And even now when it's considered, um, you know, acceptable legally to do it, it's not socially acceptable. So hang on to that, people. just right, right before, so you were saying that um, you were not the type of person that was gonna just marry whoever your parents chose for you that you wanted to choose for yourself. So yes. that's a really, um, that's a, that's, that's a rare independent thought. And that takes a lot of strength and courage and conviction to be able to make a statement like that. So talk to me a little bit. So I, I heard a bit about little Gada growing up being super religious. Hijab was put on you at nine years old. It sounds like your brothers didn't have as much of a religiously stringent upbringing as yours. But um, is it because your parents allowed you to get educated? Is that why you felt that you could stand on your own two feet and say, no, I'm gonna choose a husband for myself or what differentiated you from your cousins who were getting married off as teenagers? Or were, did you always have these thoughts in your mind? Were you always sort of pushing back? Um, I would say I, I credit this to my father more than anything. As a, as a young child, I would be, you know, as, as, more, as most kids would, you know, you get, you get interested in dinosaurs or sharks or animals in general, because I love animals. I still read about them to this day. Um, and, you know, you, you look at, you get, I got into archeology span for a bit and I got really interested in especially ancient Egypt and then ancient gods. I got into all of that sort of thing. And then um, once I got into space, that's when my dad was like, hey, um, here's a, a brief history of time by Stephen Hawking, the Big Bang Theory, go read that. And I'm like, what? And uh, he gave me all sorts of books about space, learned about, um, you know, our solar system a lot. And I got really intrigued, the whole idea that this space is so big and expansive. And he was the one that put it in my head that the Big Bang Theory is uh, a direct, like, I mean, like against the idea of God, because the way, you know, the way it talks about, um, you know, the beginning of the world and whatever, and uh, he also was the one that taught me about evolution. And uh, uh, he was the one um, that gave me all sorts of books about just in general, everything. Like he, he got me to read more about history, got me to read more about politics, 
And when you read about these things, like my father did not do that as much with my brothers. He found that I had that interest. Mm -hmm. So he gave me um, the, uh, the opportunity to continue to read and learn more. And uh, funny that my mom noticed that, oh, she likes to read. So she got me religious books, which mm -hmm. I also read. Mm -hmm. But so, that's, I believe that my, I would say I would credit my dad. He really did open my mind. And also watching, watching their marriage, that was not a very happy marriage. And then seeing everybody else, like, like I was, I remember thinking like, they barely know each other. Why are they getting mm. married? <laughs> yeah. So once your mind opened and you looked around you at your society, which is a, you know, obviously it's a highly patriarchal religion plays a huge part. Um, do you remember a point when you started to question like, why, why can't I just leave the house when I want to? Why do I have to have a male drive me where I want to go? Or yeah. There are so many times I've asked that question. Um, whenever I wanted to go out, my mom would be like, oh, uh, girls, uh, good girls don't go outside. And I'm like, but why? I just want to go see my friends. Um, you know, have, have dinner somewhere with my girlfriends. Like just whatever normal high school girls do. And we would go to what, like Chili's? Like really stupid places. Like we're not going to a freaking nightclub. That's Saudi Arabia. Where am I going? Mm -hmm. And um, the answer would always be, um, you know, it's different. You're a girl. He's a boy. You can't do this. Um, I think the biggest one, though, was like watching my brothers go to beaches and go to uh, swimming pools and be able to wear mm -hmm. shorts and a t-shirt and the heat. And I'm just not... And the answer is always, well, you know, um, you know this, is, this is a shutter. You can't question mm. a shutter. You can't. And tradition. It's just a sh shutter is the, is the law, essentially, the religious law. You can't mm. question it. That is it. You got to do it. It's like, oh, you want to go? It's like, well, if you really wanted to go to the beach, go to uh, an all-women's beach. Mm. Or, you know, just get into the water. You can go into the water. With your abaya. Oh, and you can't show off any of your, like, you can't show your legs because what if somebody looks at your ankle and gets a hard on? I'm sure the men on this call right now are having a lot of trouble. <laughs> There's I so know. many hairs. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> so, um, did you have other girlfriends in Saudi Arabia? Like what were the, are the women there? feeling like the niqab and the hijab and all of these restrictions on them are empowering and does it make them feel like strong feminists or it only they... becomes empowering when somebody is uh, when somebody else takes it off it's when you're all together um i remember sitting with my cousins and my aunts one time and we were looking at old pictures like pre-79 pictures um, before the, uh, the ultra religious, uh, wave just came over and, you know, none of the women were wearing hijab. Uh, my mom, you know, out and about in America with her hair out and other women too, you know, and now they're all covered up with, with niqab or all the whole, um, you know, uh, qatwa or the cover, a face cover. And they would all be like, oh, yeah, you have them. I'm so jealous. They're mm. so lucky they got to do this. Or they would talk about their other girlfriends. Not really. They, they, we were never really allowed to be friends with more liberal girls. But we, we are allowed to have, like, acquaintances. So they would be like, oh, yeah, this girl, she's so lucky. Her family lets her not wear hijab. Or, um, you know, this family is lucky. They don't make their girls wear hijab until they're 12 instead of 9 or something similar to that but you go immediately one person takes it off it's like oh no what why would she do that she's yeah. not respectful anymore mm. I swear to you Hada, I remember this conversation with a friend of mine she's like Hada, wallahi, I swear to you the hijab here it makes everyone respects us everybody respects us over here I'm like okay mm -hmm. you're so you're saying that she is not respectful anymore because she took it off. 
So if somebody goes up to her and harasses her, she deserves it. That's what I'm hearing. So that's what, I'm, I'm, honestly, it's never looked at as empowering. It is only empowering if somebody attacks it. If somebody attacks it. Oh. How did we get uh, Richard on the main screen? <laughs> It's because he's handsome, so he has to. Oh. <laughs> I guess I guess you're meant to say something at that point, Richard. <laughs> you got the microphone suddenly. Um, so when oh. somebody attacks it in the West or something, then they would say, oh. Yes. And then suddenly, like, oh, hijab never really stopped anybody. And then they would show, um, you know, the hijabi uh, Olympians or... Uh, hijabi, you know, business ladies and whatever, and they always forget to mention that those people come from backgrounds with supportive families. Like um, the majority of women that go out and do all of that, like if I were to wear what, um, what the American fencer was wearing, my mom mm. would call me a whore because that uh -huh. shows everything. Or the hijabi models with their oh, skin no. tight and their their makeup and their fake lashes I would have been murdered and buried in the backyard if I tried to leave the house in pants let alone the skin tight hijabi things that they wear these days and then say this is so empowering like it's just a it's it's a lie it's all propaganda it's it's, it's, it's propaganda it is it's just like it's what people don't seem to understand is that we're not generalizing. We're looking at the people that have no voice because mm -hmm. these people that are talking, that the people that are going out there that are doing all of these things, they're privileged enough because they have families that are supporting them. The majority of us don't. Mm -hmm. When I wanted to just be able to not wear like just to give you an example, I couldn't leave the house in Saudi Arabia wearing abaya if I was wearing a short skirt or shorts underneath. I had to mm -hmm. go change into pants or a long skirt in order to go out. Why? Yeah. Like, what if it opens? Mm -hmm. What if there's uh, what if there is a breeze? Mm -hmm. And it's it was just it's just ridiculous. Like sometimes I would wear pants, and if my shirt uh, was a little too short, like it wasn't covering the entire mid thigh. My mom would just look at me and she was like, Astaghfirullah, I can see everything. Yeah, my mom what would do that you, when I was a child. What are you looking at? First yeah. of all, why are you looking there? That's perverted and creepy. I'll never the forget like being a little kid. I'm when my when I had first started to wear hijab, when it was first put on me at like nine years old, where I was told that, you know, if I ever wore pants it had to be with a very long shirt that mm -hmm. like you said mine had to touch my knees so basically you're wearing yeah, dresses like at least pants. I was like at yeah. least mid thigh and if you ever wore one that was like mid like a little bit shorter my mom I remember her looking at me like I was like this disgusting filthy cockroach and I remember as a kid thinking like why am I being looked at like that? Like, what did I do? I couldn't, I was so taken aback by her, by her face, you know what I mean? By the dirty look she was giving me. And I, I just was so perplexed. And she's going on about how I just want to show my body off and wh who am I trying to please? Who am I trying to impress? Yeah. No, no, it, you know, it stayed with me for so long that even That's after shocking. coming here to the United States, I, it took me every time I went to like Banana Republic or whatever to buy pants and I would, I would wear it. I'm like, this looks, it's no, I can't wear it. This is inappropriate. It's showing too much. And then I would just buy something much bigger. And I've always worn, and until probably a little bit before I uh, met my husband, I was not wearing like pants that are my size because I really thought that in, or the only time I can wear it is if I maybe I'm stick thin and I don't have curves. And if I have, because, because I am curvy, I have to take, you know, extra precautions when it comes to what I'm wearing because it's not professional to wear these pants to work. And then I would go to work and like, 
all even the curvy women are just wearing the normal pants and nobody's like looking at them nobody's saying anything mm -hmm. it's totally fine yeah and it it was just like a mind it, even after forcing myself to go out and wear clothes that are my size it still felt extremely like I felt naked I felt like somebody was staring at me I thought that HR would just come over to me and be like hey um tone it down a little <laughs> that, that is your abaya <laughs> <laughs> because when I was in Saudi and um, I worked in Aramco, so it was more yeah. open. Um, I wore, I would wear the long, the long shirt alongside with my pants and my pants were always baggy. And through the grapevine, I learned that uh, literally the men, the old disgusting men over there were saying that they would re that that what I was wearing was very revealing, shows everything. She's not even trying to hide her assets. And boy, would I love to go and ride her. Literally, uh, that's what they would be saying to each other. And after that, I, when, so when you hear something like that, of course, I immediately internalized it and started wearing Rabbi at work. And that's why hijab is rape culture. Because it perpetuates this rape culture. It perpetuates this victim blaming, right? It, 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 it tells you that the actions or the thoughts of these slimy men is your problem, is your responsibility. And you accept that. And you don't even question it. And you're like, yep, yeah, okay. So I'm going to have to start wearing abaya now. Because yeah, I'm responsible and, for these men. And whenever you see, uh, to this day, this happens. Like when uh, um, uh, like the static crowd went and started harassing this woman, everybody was like, well, what was she doing there? Why mm -hmm. did she go there? Of course, she must have been asking for it. And the biggest thing I've always heard was from um, the, uh, the, the, the Saudi people was like, um, in Arabic, لو كانت محترمة ما حتى He's like, mm -hmm. if she was covered respectful. up and all respectful, then nobody would have. I, was like, I swear that if she had been wearing hijab, nobody would have touched her. Yeah. I'm like, really? Yeah. Really? Have you gone to the mall? Have you? Because my mother is covered up from head to toe, a married woman with four children, and she gets sexually harassed. Are you telling me she's not respectful? Because I, I don't know. Women in niqab get sexually harassed. Yeah. yeah. There's the statistic from Egypt which is so shocking, it sounds like I'm making it up, but you can look it up, where 99.3% of women in Egypt report being sexually harassed. So I guess 99.3% of women in Egypt are disrespectful people that don't respect themselves, right? You, it always gets turned on the women. And this is something that in the, in the West, I wanna make this your story, but I'm just gonna have a little bit of a rant, where, in the West, they'll recognize it immediately, right? They'll do those slut walks and they'll say a woman can wear whatever she wants to wear. It's none of your business. It's the criminal. It has nothing to do with her. But when it comes to the hijab, suddenly their brain misfires. They forget everything that they've learned and everything that they understand about feminism and about slut shaming and about victim blaming. And suddenly they're putting the hijab on the cover of magazines and they're calling it empowering. And you're seeing it on every flat surface. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that dichotomy. So you mm -hmm. left Saudi Arabia, you came to the U.S. Yes. To seek asylum here in the free mm -hmm. West. Tell yeah. me a little bit about, um, tell me a little bit about that experience and, and how that sort of just the juxtaposition between these two cultures, these two societies, how has that all been for you? Okay, I want to go, I want to take a step back a little yeah. bit. So um, uh, through, I was able to study in the United States and that's where I got my engineering degree. And I remember during our like orientation and whatever, everybody was telling us about culture shock and you'll go there and it's going to be culture shock, blah, 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 blah. I go to uh, the US and I swear to you that it felt like my, 18 years in Saudi was culture shock. Mm -hmm. And I'm finally here when I'm not in culture mm -hmm. shock. 
I never experienced that because to me, that was like, this is normal. Mm. I can go out. And you know what I wanted to do when I wanted, when I wanted to go out, I wanted to go for a walk. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. You know, it was, it's like the dumbest, smallest thing. I you can't walk by yourself for a walk. in Saudi Arabia. That's no it. Way. Mm-hmm. And uh, which is why now one of my favorite things to do is go hiking. It's just mm-hmm. a walk. And uh, so uh, fast forward a few years later, and I'm in, in my 20s, and I'm here in the U.S., and um, it's, it's the first time that I got to experience America as actually America, because before it was college. You know, when you're college, that's not real, that's not real life. College is not real life. So uh, and in the real world, uh, and I'm, I guess I was lucky because I it did end up in Texas, and in Texas... Uh, people are super duper nice. And uh, when they know about my past, they immediately want to help. Um, sometimes they think I'm Christian, but you know, sometimes I let them think that, <laughs> 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 but not anymore. <laughs> but uh, the biggest justification, uh, the, the biggest thing actually probably was um, just seeing how people would tell me, it's like, yeah, but that's just your culture, right? Mm. I mean, my, I just told you, my mother sent me death threats. Mm. I was like, yeah, but I mean, this happens also in Christian circles. Mm. It's like, oh, do you know somebody personally that has sent, that has sent their daughter death threats? And uh, it, it, the one thing that really bothered me was something I actually messaged you the other day. And um, mm. I want to talk a little bit about it because I've, I've heard from other people. Um, usually whenever I wanted to see therapy, I would seek it through the secular therapy project because uh, I don't want somebody to start talking to me about religion. And whenever I would um, you know, research a, uh, a therapist, I would make sure that in none of their profiles, whether their website or their Psychology Today web, uh, you know, page or anywhere else where they're mentioned, they, are not, they do not put their religion. And, I don't, and I'm not saying that I would choose a Christian. I, if anybody goes out of their way to put their religion on their website or article or whatever, I don't choose them as my therapist mm-hmm. because that, that's just me. I don't feel comfortable. I want somebody secular. I want secular therapy. Mm-hmm. So I reached out recently to a, um, a therapist um, that was referred to me by somebody else. And after having a talk with her, uh, she decided later on to send me an email to let me know like, hey, um, after talking to you, I don't think I would be able to help you, though um, I would like to refer you to, you know, this person. So I did my research the same way I would ever do, and she had gone out of her way to put her religion on her profile as Islam. Mm. So she referred me to a Muslim. After listening to me talk about my trauma growing up as a Muslim, about how I never had a choice, never had a choice to do anything, because of the religion and you're asking me to it was just so infuriating to me. Mm-hmm. and uh, the more and then so I let her know like hey I'm not I'm not okay with this I'm not comfortable with the Muslim she's like I hear you I was like but did you <laughs> yeah did you mm. so I told her please and as a suggestion next time if an ex-Muslim comes to you do not refer them to a Muslim therapist I it's mean, fucking one of one. Yeah, absolutely. It's just, I, I, I don't even, what could be the, what is the thought process here? He so, said her thought process was, um, I thought that somebody from the same culture, she was in yes. I, don't, I don't even understand. That's not the same culture. That's yes. very, it's very racist of her to be completely honest. Like if you wanted somebody from my culture, at least she's an Arab. Yeah. So it so, was very racist of her too. Do you think that in the West, this, you, you sort of alluded to some apologetics of Islam where they say like, oh yeah, you know, Christian people also <laughs> um, threaten their children with death. Um, those kinds of like immediate knee-jerk apologetics, things like this, do you think that they come from a misunderstanding, like a not understanding the difference between religion and culture or thinking that um, like, why do you think that they feel that they need to defend Islam and to 
because Islam has done a very great job with their propaganda. They mm -hmm. are the second largest religion. Islam is the second largest religion. It is the fastest growing religion. So you, so for them, uh, because now, because in, in the Muslim world, no one can say anything about Islam. Islam is a taboo type subject. You only say good things. Any bad thing is because of the person or the culture. It's not Islam. Islam is perfect, people are not. And that's, now that Muslims have gone you know, outside. Now they're a minority somewhere else. And uh, they realize like, oh shit, in this other country, they can actually talk badly about religion. So they've kind of made it so as because your religion is this from this other place, then if you criticize it, you're just being ignorant. You don't understand this. You're racist. This doesn't come from whatever. So then uh, the, the way, and if you do speak with, uh, you know, Muslims, they immediately say, well, this is what Christianity does. This is what Judaism does. So it's the very same tactics. The whataboutism mm -hmm. is happening now on the other side. Mm -hmm. Where even like the atheists are mentioning like, yeah, but you know, Christianity, the Crusades. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, the Crusades were so long ago. Mm -hmm. Can you please move on? <laughs> yeah. So I agree with you. So the, the same rhetoric, the same narratives, the same, uh, the same tactics that are used to stifle criticism in the Muslim majority world are used in the Western world for the same purpose. So to, yeah. to stop people from criticizing. And it's, but it's, do you think... And I just want to add one more thing is that, you know, the way they mention it specifically, oh, you can't criticize Islam because that's racism. It's just the person. So what? You want me to be racist now? You want you want me to be racist? You're saying mm -hmm. this is because of the person, right? Mm -hmm. Because of their, mm -hmm. their their skin color, not their religion, right? Mm. Yeah, exactly. So there just seems to be an inordinate amount of people from that side of the world that are comfortable with suicide vests and stabbing or people rape, randomly or, or being yeah. their wives. Yeah, there's no source for all of this. Uh, do you think that? terrorism plays a part in that? Do you think that the terrorism that happens in the Western world scares people into silence so that it's not only because they don't want to be racist, but because they're they legitimately be scared? Um, the, I, I think that's what stifles like a lot of the, um, you know, the Muhammad cartoons or the criticism of the religion, because that's all blasphemy. Uh, I do think a lot of it is like, especially you, you get to see that in the rhetoric with like Charlie Hebdo versus school shootings. Nobody goes and tells the kids, the blames the kids that this is, they, they deserve it because God, they, nobody deserves to be shot. People go to school in order to feel safe. People go to work and they expect to be safe. And no, no one, I don't care what you do. You can come over to me. You can come over right now and badmouth me, badmouth my husband, tell, tell me all sorts of bad things about us. That doesn't justify me coming over and shooting you in the face. So when people say about the Charlie Hebdo, like, yes, that's really bad, but, but that's not really Islam. And I mean, if you think about it, they shouldn't, they really shouldn't have done that. That's actually pretty racist mm -hmm. of them to publish those cartoons. Mm -hmm. Are you victim blaming? Mm -hmm. it's it's extremely and, and so I really do it has to be I mean it, it, I don't know I mean I'm not an expert I haven't really researched this but it has to be why else would they be so scared to criticize it it's just mm -hmm. a religion mm -hmm. why why are we able to put uh, you know Christ in a gimp suit um, and uh, show it off everywhere but we draw one picture of Muhammad and immediately somebody wants somebody shot or killed or stabbed or beheaded. What are we going to do about that? How are we going to, so people like you and me, and there's, there's a lot of us, you know, not everybody can get out, but there's a lot of people all around the Muslim majority world. You know, I, I, I hear a lot from people in Iraq um, where they're seeing and now the Somali community are getting louder, where they're just seeing so much ignorance, hate, violence in their cultures, in their countries, in their communities. You know, Indonesian people are starting to get really upset 
overseeing how their culture is changing and is becoming so much more militant. And the more Islamic it becomes, the more violent it becomes. Um, and, and you're seeing this happen everywhere and you're seeing people feel very um, upset about it. And when they try to speak out, so what I'm thinking now of Hamad Abdel Samad, who is an Egyptian German um, critic of Islam, and he had to leave Germany because of the, the death threats and the Germany would not protect him in the same way that they would protect Muslims. They wouldn't defend him. Um, so I know another Muslim critic of Islam in Germany who she has 11 bodyguards. So 24, seven round the clock um, because she's a critic of Islam and because she wants to be a female imam, Muslims want to kill her. And so she has the, the government of, of, you know, Berlin is paying for her to have all of this protection. Whereas Hamid, who is born in German, no, he's not born in Germany, but he's a German citizen, um, was not going to get the same protection because he's not a Muslim. Yeah. So he, yeah. So he actually had to leave Germany and he is now living in Lebanon Lebanon Where, is more safe. And in his podcast with Ayan Hersiali, he talks about how in when he goes on television in Lebanon and Morocco and Tunisia and stuff like that, they talk about how he is a beacon of enlightenment in the Islamic world. And they wish that there was like, you know, thousands of Hamad Abdul Samads out there and stuff like that. Dude, Whereas, I, love, I love him. Yeah, me too. Whereas in the West, he's being called an Islamophobic bigot and his talks are being canceled, et cetera, et cetera. How do we, you and I are people that have a one foot in each camp. How do we speak to our Western friends? How do we communicate with them? How do we get through to them? What have you found in your experience um, was was useful for you? What I found to be useful was, I mean, honestly, it's, it's, I mean, nothing has changed, but the only thing that I can think of is we need to change actual policies that we have in the West. The, the Muslims have a lot of a lot of backing. They have Saudi Arabia and Qatar, or they have the UAE, they have, they have the oil money. They have the money, they have uh, the people that are going and lobbying for them. We don't. The only thing, and a lot of us don't have the energy. A lot of us, like you said, get these threats. And then I mean, we, we have to choose like, oh, do we get armed bodyguards or uh, do we continue to do this or do we risk getting killed? And then it's, it's a very, it's a very difficult thing, but the only, but, I mean, I honestly don't see anything that can be done other than lobbying because that is the one we have to change the policies. We have to change the strategies. That's the only way or else they will continue to win because they have that power and money. Yeah. And that's what they're doing. They're pushing the agendas. I mean, look yeah. at that. When 9-11 happened, the majority of the hijackers were Saudi. Saudi was never touched because yeah. they got the money. Mm. And, and George Bush was the one that said the whole, like, you know, this is not from Islam, Islam mm. is a religion of peace or whatever. George mm. goddamn Bush said that. Mm. Yeah, yeah. You think he would have said that from the goodness of his heart after 9-11? Mm. No. He doesn't believe that. that. That came straight out of Saudi. Yeah. Money talks. So, um, so you, at the beginning of our conversation, you were kind of using air quotes when you were talking about MBS and the changes in Saudi Arabia. Are yeah. you feeling like it's all window dressing and it's all just sort of appeasing um, the international community, but none of it is, is real? Is that what you're feeling? Yes. And I also see MBS as this young dictator. Uh, he's using the same old Arab dictator methods of silencing putting people behind bars, uh, uh, you know, not just building, hacking a bunch of people to death. Um, you know, he's ordering killings, ordering uh, all sorts of bad things, but then he comes up and he's like, 
We want to open this country for tourism. Women mm. now can own their own houses and live on their own and go and travel outside without a guardian and also work. Mm. But at the same time, you have Lujain al which is still mm. being har harassed in Saudi. For what? For wanting women to have more rights that are given right now. Mm -hmm. So do you have hope that things are changing in the Arab or Muslim majority world in a more open-minded, secular, liberal direction? Or do you think that it's just all fake? I don't think it's fake. I think it's genuine. I think the, the rise of uh, secularism in the, the Muslim world is, is increasing, even if uh, what we see is not that. Um, that and I mean, if you go to like my my cousins that I that are still some of them talk to me occasionally, um, they tell me like everything is open. Even my family is becoming more open mm -hmm. uh, because the younger generation is a lot more open than the older generation, and the older generation is gonna die. Mm -hmm. The one thing that needs to change is the strategy and the policy that we have in the Middle East by the, from the Western world. We can't continue to back up, pack the dictators that we have, that they've put in place from God knows when. Mm -hmm. um, because then you'll just have another Arab Spring that will end up the same way Libya and Syria has happened. We can't let that happen. But until, until somebody from the Western world actually condemns what the, uh, especially the Gulf region is doing, it's, nothing's gonna change, it has to. Mm -hmm. We have to keep on, we have to make, you can't say that you know we, we want democracy where we are, but we don't want it for other people because they are not smart enough to choose the right mm -hmm. choices because mm -hmm. what? We have to put in a dictator to choose for them? Yeah. Like MBS wants to be the benevolent dictator that uh, forces people to progress. People are already progressing. Give it, I know it's not the same when, if you give, if you change the laws and the laws are now that you have the freedom to speak, to do, uh, to travel, then it'll come. But if you are going to stay as a dictator and if you were like, yeah, well, I would really like to drive. Okay, now you get to go to jail. And then we're going to let women drive, but you shut up. Mm. How is that any helpful? Yeah. Yep. All right. Uh, we are going to open it up to question and answer. I have multiple essays written here. Ooh, I <laughs> oh see so. Gosh. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for everyone who's got their cameras on. Nice to see your beautiful faces. And those of you who have your cameras off, um, please feel free to, to write a question for us in the chat. Um, before I start reading through these essays, is there anyone with their video on now who wants to ask a question of Rada? Sarah, my girl. All right, go ahead, please. Sarah was my forgotten feminist from last time, week before last. You guys hear me? We can hear you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Gada, Yasmin, and all of you. I, I love you girls. I love you guys. Um, you're amazing. And Gada, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. And congratulations for your new uh, marriage. Uh, I'm happy for you. And everything about you said about the West, you know, uh, trying to glorify Islam, trying to, we need to, I think first, we need to differentiate you know we need to differentiate islam and race so the way they do it they use islam as a race and it's really disgusting uh the other day i was having a conversation with somebody and somebody was like well you hate islam and i said i mean you hate islam because it's a race and then i was like well islam is not a race like it's an ideology just like christianity i think the problem i see what's happening in the west they there is no diff to put it, to put difference Islam and the Muslim. Muslim are individuals with different cultures, different language. Like Yasmin explained a lot of time, uh, and Islam is an ideology just like Christianity. And Islam has need to be criticized just as Christianity. We have a right to criticize it. Um, so I think it, the problem in the West is 
uh, I, and I work in a school education and I see the hijab is being glorified and uh, little girls are wearing it. And it's, it's really, I think, what the victimhood, Islam just gets away whatever it wants because it's just always the victimhood. And I think it, we need to just keep speaking and educating our friend in the West saying, you know what, Islam is an ideology. It's not a race. It just has a right as in Christianity, we can criticize it. And I really appreciate it, you guys speaking out and we just have to keep speaking and thank you so much. Love you guys. Love you, Sarah. Ahmed had his hand up. Okay, so did you wanna to respond to anything Sarah said? I agree with her 100%. Yeah. yeah. And I will continue to speak, I'm not gonna stop. Yeah, I think that the reason why that they conflate religion, the religion of Islam with a race is so that they can call it racism, right? So it's, it's just another silencing tactic. I mean, wasn't the guy in uh, Norway white? Yeah, yeah, or the Boston bombers, they're Russian, but anyway. Uh, Hannah, we'll let you go. And then who did you say had their hand up? Hamid? Okay, Hamid? well, Hannah and then Hamid. Hi, Amanda. I, I'm sorry about the audio because I, I came to a cafe for some privacy with speaking, but I'm a fellow apostate. I was born and raised in Florida. But my question for you is, what, what can we do that would influence this lobby? Because I know there's certain politicians such as Tulsi Gabbard that are willing to acknowledge the Islamist foundation of certain things like an 9-11. Um, personally, I, I, I think things would be better if we had more people like her in the government. But I'm just, I guess my question is like, how, how, what can we do? How can we like try to, I guess, raise awareness or get more people like her inside the government? The, the, if you have money, I guess I would say donate to people that are lobbying. If you can become a lobbyist, become a lobbyist. I don't know how to be a lobbyist. I've never really looked into it. Um, I, I think it's a fake job, but hey, if it's a fake job, <laughs> might as well have somebody uh, on our side doing it. Um, voting in people that are like that, trying not to attack them whenever they speak. Um, if anybody remembers the talk with uh, Asra Nomani and Ayan Hersali when they went and testified in Congress and Kamala Harris did absolutely not look at them, maybe not have her as vice president. Um, you know, things like that. You know, it's the more it's we're not talking as loudly. We're not doing things as loudly. We don't have the organizations that they have. We don't have the money that they have. So I think the, the only thing that we can do, honestly, is that if you do, if you if you know somebody that has, uh, you know, a, a sympathetic, somebody that is sympathetic to our cause to help and uh, to continue to do that, there are congressmen and women um, that are that are you know uh, sympathetic to us, and they get attacked or they have to stay quiet. I think the more they, the more we encourage them, the more if you write to, I mean, I do it. I write to my Congress people and my senators, even though my senator is Ted Cruz and I hate him, but I still write him, um, you know, do something, you know, don't stay quiet. I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat, just do something. I will at this point plug that I am working with the Ion Hersielli Foundation on an initiative and Hannah works with the Ion Hersielli Foundation as well. Um, so I'm working on an initiative where we're having the first working group meeting on December 9th, where it's a coalition of bringing together everybody, Muslims, ex-Muslims, Jewish, Hindu, atheist, whatever, doesn't matter, never believed in a God. Um, that part is irrelevant. The relevant part is that we're all working together as a united front, as a united voice against Islamism. So we want to be sort of that hub that you guys are talking about right now. Like, where can we go? How can we lobby? How do we support the Congress people that we like? Um, mm -hmm. And so we will, we're aiming to be that group that will help to spearhead those uh, initiatives. So inshallah, we'll be off the ground running soon. And you guys- I'll pray for you. 
Yes. <laughs> Make dua. <dark. laughs> nether, nether. <laughs> Um, I saw Luke's hand go up and, oh, Hamid, Hamid, you're next. Well, thank you, Jasmine. Thank you, Dada. Uh, what a story. It's very familiar for a person born and raised in Iran. That's just, I can feel and understand it with every cell of my, of my brain. Um, I have a quick comment and a question. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as actually Sarah mentioned, there is a lot of, uh, I would say, misunderstanding or confusion in liberal world. I'm not, we are not counting on dictatorship like China and Russia. I think we have to find our allies in democratic world. And um, like you mentioned, uh, the Islamic propaganda is very, very powerful. And they have a lot of allies here too. Mm -hmm. um, for, for Iran government, we have journalists here without hijab, without very modern looking, but they are supporting those governments for any reason. Our only means is just to, um, again, as mentioned, to raise awareness about Islam and the fact that Islamophobia doesn't make any sense. Islam in itself is scary and everyone should know that. Um, that's our only tool and we have to get uh, more people, liberal people with us. I have a colleague actually, um, a white person, and he's a good person, but he, she actually, sorry, she thinks or thought that hijab is a personal choice. I mean, why mm. you're, you know, making a fuss about it? And I tried to explain, that. so there are people who really, with their mentality here, they think that um, it's just the culture or, or their choice. Um, and because they cannot really uh, speak as we can here, I think we have a more um, we have more responsibility to just make this known everywhere. Uh, this was this was a quick comment of mine. Um, but the question uh, it's interesting that in Iran, I would say the strongest um, uh, movement is happening. It's probably you cannot see it. It's underneath. And actually one of the most powerful is called um, normal life. And this is really a secular movement that just like you, when you talk about, you know, freedom of walking, et cetera, people in Iran, they just want that, they, especially the women. And you need actually men to definitely support women for that, for that work. Uh, my question to you is, I, I know for sure that in Iran, this is happening and it's very powerful. How about Saudi Arabia, through your friends and, and you know, uh, canals that you have, is the same thing happening in, in Saudi Arabia too? 100%, yes. And if you, um, if you want, you can always, uh, there's so many amazing ladies. A lot of them are uh, using pseudonyms, but uh, there's a huge feminist movement in Saudi Arabia that I am very, like, so proud of. Uh, you can find, uh, I, I left Twitter, but um, uh, a lot of them, you know, they, they have these threads that they talk about. It's a lot, it's a lot of it is more geared towards other women, letting them know like, hey, if this has happened to you, it's not your fault. Just because somebody, uh, you know, touched your boob when you were walking or uh, yelled at you or cat called you, that's not your fault. Uh, that uh, your, your husband giving you the, uh, you know, the green light to go work, hey, it's your right to work. It's not his right to stop you from it. Uh, so yes, this is definitely happening. It's, uh, it, oh, there's also like all sorts of other movements, not necessarily um, ones by the government, ones that are by the people themselves. Yeah. Uh, Luke, you're next. Hi, God, I don't know, um, really inspiring. Um, yeah, amazing story. Um, I said two points really that I just wanted to sort of get your opinion on. Um, one, I'd say still that I'm I'm a lefty and I sort of hang out in left wing circles most of the time, um, but I immediately face any sort of like shutdown the minute you bring up Islam, you know, straight away gone. Um, and I said two sort of ideas on that, really, and I just wondered if you thought it was kind of true. One was, I think part of that is because of the rise of like identity politics on, on the left a little bit, where it seems to me anyone with kind of like a fucking brain in their nut can kind of 
rationally understand the difference between being critical of Islam and also defending Muslims as individual people from bigotry or, um, you know, racism or, or whatever it is. Anyone can really make that difference. But it feels like what I've come up against is because of the rise of identity politics, people are now put in blocks and discussed that way by the left. Um, I wondered if you if that's something that you'd noticed. And secondly, was my experience was when I first become involved with like left wing politics, which was like university. I come from a working class family, really. Um, and like my dad was kind of the underclass until we moved out to a nicer area and I went to a better school and I managed to go to university. And I noticed at uni, the left had become very, very white middle class. And I wondered whether that kind of complete narrow like kind of life experience for that that culture on the left has influenced the fact that they can't see anything outside of just like you know if if it must just be white people's fault that this is kind of the way that um so it can only be christianity which is stupid because obviously only white people aren't christians but uh, <laughs> that that's that i just what those is two points really i just wondered if you agreed or if you had any thoughts on that really yeah um <clears throat> the identity politics things for sure it's it's come to the point where people i don't know if it's people um realizing that um it's much more difficult to just i don't i, I honestly i'm trying my best to understand why identity politics rose i don't know if it's a uh, uh, just to fill a kind of gaping hole of, or if it's just uh, racist being more racist, but in a different manner. Um, but I do definitely see that from the way I would be combating that. And it's also another um, answer to Hamid's first um, comment is to use identity politics against them. Oh, you want to you want to be talking? You're telling me that it's Islamophobic, or we don't want to talk about that, or you know you're brown, so you're definitely in this position. It's like, well, that comes from a place of privilege. You're mm -hmm. you're you, oh, you're saying uh, hijab is a choice. Well, you know, having that choice is a privilege. It really is. Having the choice to put it on and take it off is a privilege because in a lot of cases we don't have that choice. Um, oh, you have the privilege to, um, you know, tell me that I can't talk about this because, well, that's a, that's privilege because we, you are privileged. You, you don't get um, your genitals mutilated. You don't get uh, put in your house or married off at nine years old or 10 or 12 or 15. That's privilege. So you, it's, it's always use it against them. I always do it. I have used that against Jim one time when he told me he thinks that religion is cute. I told him that comes from a place of privilege. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah Jim is her husband um yeah I uh I'm actually Chandler is here and he hasn't raised his hand but I'm gonna that's actually something he's talked about quite a bit about how sort of what you just mentioned there about how white people are actually being the racists in this scenario um and that's something I hadn't really it's very it sounds a lot like orientalism to me yes yeah so i don't know if you wanted to speak to that chandler no you're, you're muted. muted no that's okay you don't have to i put you on the spot am i on you're yes. on <laughs> i never know how to, i still don't know how to do this damn thing i'm sorry for being late i was driving my kid off to his new job yay um yay he's got a job now um I think that the the uh, the one thing that's absolutely amazing is this, this choice idea. Well, yeah, women can choose to. In the Southern Baptist Convention, I wrote this book. I'm gay. I wrote this book on uh, sexual orientation biology, and it came out. It was published by Hyperion, which is the Disney publishing thing. And as a result, I am very proud to say that I was one of the reasons. My book was one of the reasons that the Southern Baptist Convention called a boycott of Disney. And um, <laughs> That one one of my great proud moments, and it's it's very funny because the 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 great majority of women in the Southern Baptist Convention, they made a decision because they felt the world was spinning too liberal, to say women must follow their husbands, they must be subjugated to their husbands, and you know that's and, and, as a result of this thing, and yeah, you can choose to do that, but if we have any 
fucking values as liberals, then we say, no, it's a bad, it's an anti-liberal decision. And you could choose to wear hijab, but, you know, you, you're, liberal position. you're choosing to participate in, in your own oppression. People choose to participate in their own oppression all the time. Love it. Yes, I say that too. I'm like, you're free to get a swastika tattoo on your face. And I'm free to think that you're a Nazi asshole. Right, exactly. I'm, I can have a judgment on your choices. I'm not stopping you. You go ahead and do whatever you want to do. But now I know what you are. And I'm going to voice my opinion about what, the, what you are, you know, basically sharing about yourself to the world. Uh, Rami? Right. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chandler. And Rami, sorry to... Uh, no, that's fine. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, when, when talking to sort of my, maybe my believer friends uh, or so, uh, I often deal with this statement, which is like, uh, oh, you're just too bitter. Uh, you're just yeah. so angry about this religion that you took too seriously almost. And you have this like emotional reaction while everyone else was uh, sort of flexible around it. Uh, I wonder if you like, uh, deal with that too. I wonder if that's maybe why you were referred to this Muslim therapist because maybe the healthy thing to do would be f like for you to be less bitter and show acceptance as she might have or something. And uh, so, yeah, how would you deal with this thing where it's almost uh, uh, they're telling you you're having an emotionally exaggerated reaction to something you grew up with? And, yeah. yeah. Um, I was actually talking about this with a friend of mine yesterday and he said that it's it's punching down. They're punching down. If anybody else would come to you with a trauma, um, let's say, you know, a, a, any trauma, anything, um, you know, your family abused you by, you know, beating you when you were a child and then you finally were able to leave. And then you mention that to somebody and then you're like, oh, well, you're just bitter because other parents didn't beat up their kids. You know, if you just left earlier, then this never, never would have happened. Or maybe it was like, have you ever thought, I mean, have you thought that maybe, I don't know, if you had just stayed quiet, your dad wouldn't have beat you up? Mm -hmm. It's punching down. If you, it's, the trauma is very real. And it's, if it's any other religion, if it's, Catholic, if it's Catholicism, then nobody would be like, well, it's, and it's not really that. I mean, it's, it's because you had, you took it too seriously and you went to the church a lot and you stayed a little late. Of course, the priest is going to diddle you. Really? It's punching down. It's the way I would, the, the only thing I would say is like, yes, uh, I did take it seriously. Yes. Um, I am emotional. It's very normal to feel emotional because of that. It's something that engulfed your entire life. It's not the same as, um, you know, something that you just, you know, tried out for two years and then left it. It's something that you were born in. It was engulfed in. It was your every single day. And then when you leave in situations like, you know, Yasmin's and, Yasmin and mine, where our freaking families wanted nothing to do with us, we became, we became garbage to them just because we didn't want to live the life that they uh, wanted us to live as extensions of themselves. You know, that's extremely traumatic, no matter what. I don't care if people tell me like, oh, this is just because you had bad parents or um, it's because you were extreme and took it to the extremes. Like, I never had a choice. This is something that was put on me. You're blaming me for my own childhood trauma. That is really punching down and really pretty an asshole thing to do. I, I always say that to people, um, even my therapist, <laughs> When I mentioned to her, like, please don't ever do that. That's triggering and re-traumatizing. Just always, honestly, I, I, would, I would take it. Like, yes, it's, and you are being an asshole right now by blaming my childhood trauma on myself mm. or belittling it or diminishing it. It's invalidating. But I, if I could add to that, Rada, I agree with you that you should just own it. So when they say, oh, you're just angry, you're just emotional, I own that. Like, yes, I am angry. And why aren't you? What the fuck is wrong with you that you're not angry at women getting their gen at little girls getting their genitals cut, at getting forced into marriages, at, you know, anybody who identifies with the LGBT community being executed in about a dozen countries around the world? Doesn't that make you upset? So it's like, turn it back on them. 
instead of them making it a bad thing that you're angry, it's like, no, you should be angry. The fact that you're not angry about it says a lot about you and how you lack empathy for other human beings. Especially, um, and it's funny to me when, because I have a gay friend over here um, that people tell him that he's just too Islamophobic. I was like, oh, really? <laughs> I'm Islamophobic? They literally want to kill him. Of course he's afraid. <laughs> Not only would they kill me, they'll kill you too. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, your gay friend? <clears throat> I'm sorry, Hada, where do you live? Um, I live in Texas. And, and you have a gay friend who doesn't want to- Saudi. He's also from Saudi. We both came from Saudi. So he's gay, he's, his family abandoned him because he's gay and he's not, he wasn't gonna come here and be like, I'm gonna be in the closet, obviously, which is good for him and I'm happy for him. He, uh, but he's, every time he meets somebody and uh, they talk about like the religion or like how he grew up and how, I was like, oh, being too, well, you're, you're too angry or you're too Islamophobic or whatever. It's like, yeah, because in my country, I would have been killed. We're imprisoned, we're tortured, or beaten up. It's weird when gay Muslims are like that because they're trying so hard to be part of a group that hate them. And it, it's sad. It's sad when I see that. Oh my God, I just had another essay. <laughs> oh, Alia, just turn on your camera and, and tell us all say. of this. Oh I my God. You. Okay. Um, I, I want to congratulate you God, on your marriage and your freedom from Islam. I am I also left the Shia Muslim faith so I can resonate somewhat with your experiences and the brainwashing. My tops also had to be mid thigh length and I also never learned how to swim. Although after having children, I made sure my kids did and learned everything I wasn't allowed to. Yes, I am. In the midst of ta taking my kids to the pool and the beaches, I can say that I have graduated from being able to slim to at all to floating on my back. That's amazing. As an American, I definitely see the hypocrisy of people where Muslims and Islam are protected at all costs, while the actual victims of oppression of this religion and Muslims are constantly labeled as racist, Islamophobes, and bigots. Yes, we need to speak out. Yes. I agree. Thank you so much. And I'll mention that um, I also have a talk with Aaliyah up on YouTube. She was my first uh, Forgotten Feminists guest. So um, you can watch that discussion as well. Um, and then Trisha says, most gay groups are now supportive of Gaza, Hamas, where they'd be killed. Yeah, that's a lot of that, you know, chickens for, for Kentucky Fried Chicken happening. David has a question about whether or not my sect is used against me when I'm telling my story. Every time I'm told I'm not a real Muslim. <gasps> by, by Sunnis. Yeah, by Sunnis. Uh, so they just have to have something. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You're not a real Muslim. And okay, so fine. I was Sunni. It's like, okay, but you don't understand the Quran. Arabic is my first language. Okay, but you know what I mean? Like there's always like some other excuse that they're trying to come up with. But um, yeah, I didn't know that that was another one that was used. Mm -hmm. It's used all the time. I, it's used all the, I have friends who are Bora Muslims in, in, in Mumbai and they're told all the time by Shia and Sunni, they're not Muslim. No, yes, in general, yes, but I didn't, well, I mean, I guess it's not a surprise, because if you're, if your Sunni Muslims don't consider a, any of the other sects real Muslims anyway, I mean, they barely consider themselves real Muslims. There's, <laughs> there's a, there's this hilarious meme of, uh, where it says, uh, the last Muslim on earth, and he's got a sword in his toes, and he's like trying to stab himself. <laughs> And that's really what it is. They're just constantly, you're not a real Muslim, you're not a real Muslim, you're not Muslim enough. And, and it's like, where, where does this end? But then at the same time, they'll tell you there's 2 billion Muslims and we are a huge Ummah, the second largest religion on the planet. So when the numbers work in their favor, then they'll count Shia and Ahmadi and everybody else. But when it comes to attacking each other and literally killing each other, so yeah. Sunnis will kill Shia and Sunnis will kill Ahmadi. Um, 
In Pakistan, they are not allowed to call themselves Muslim. In Egypt, they'll kill Sufi Muslims as well. Uh, so yeah, there's there's a lot of inner fighting going on all the time, constantly. Yeah, and the other part, um, it's so the you weren't a real Muslim. Uh, the biggest one for ex Shia and for um, gay people, it's like oh, you only left because you're gay. If you're gay, you're not really Muslim. Or you wanted to have bacon, or I mean, I I want to have bacon and I want drinks <laughs> and I want to have sex and I want to be able to go out. And yes, I don't want to wear hijab. And yes, if uh -huh. those are the only reasons to leave Islam, those are legitimate. Yeah. Just you want to be free. Uh, Erkan says Muslims have censorship envy. They want parity with Jewish people in terms of protection. Yeah, that's why they made up the word Islamophobia. They want to equate it to anti-Semitism. But of course, Jews are counted as a distinct ethnic group. As a number of people have said here, Muslims are not an ethnic group. The OIC constantly pressures the UN. And Ilhan Omar recently is now trying to push... Um, for Sarah, you read about this? Yeah, where she's trying to push for an Islamophobia law or something where it's not even just within America. She wants it to be universal oh. where you fight against anybody who is considered Islamophobic because they speak out against Islam. Yeah. Can you imagine? Yeah. She is bringing the Pakistani blasphemy laws yeah. to the United States of America. And that uh, United ah. Kingdom, remember the lady that spoke about how, um, you know, talking about Muhammad is is, is uh, hurting the sentiments of billions. Like, are you serious? Is how hurting they... sentiment, is, is the hurting sentiment more important than freedom of speech? That's, well, where are your values? Anyway, is there anyone else that, that I've missed? I know there's a lot of chat going on here and I haven't read most of it. Um, but if there's somebody who has written something in the chat that wants to ask Fada a question or share something, um, I don't wanna hang up before you have a chance to do that. So just wanna make sure everybody's had a chance to talk. And, um, and I wanted to say, um, since I actually like everybody here, um, if you want, um, you know, if you need something from me or need talk to me, um, a question, anything at all, um, just let, let Yusman know and I will, um, I'll let him know, I'll let her know how to reach me. So I saw that Luke and Erkan, am I saying your name properly? Is it Erkan? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, okay, yeah. good. I uh, saw you guys unmuted yourselves. Um, I don't know which one of you wants say, to go first. I was just going to say thanks. Um, and I just had one last point, really, about kind of the the defense of it. One of the reasons I always fucking hated religion is because, like, and I think at its most dangerous, it makes you a follower while convincing you you're a leader. Yes. And I think um, the defense of it by non-Muslims or, like, well-meaning kind of middle-class white liberals is almost religious because I think they're so convinced that they're doing the right thing that whatever the ideology around that particular topic is, they just swallow and there's just no, that's it, it's gone. It's like a ho the horse is bolted and you can't get them back. Like, do you know what I mean? It's like a deaf, like, dog or something. They've gone, you can't get them back. And I think that's kind of part of the problem is, like, the, the defence of it by the non-religious is quite religious as well. I think that's kind of a problem. But, yeah, that was just just the point. But thank you very much. Um, There's a lot, there's there's probably too much that, that I actually want to say, but and you want to finish I, I know but um I just want I just want to say thanks as well it was a really interesting talk and thanks a lot and but just to go back to your point about um free speech I think and we've been mentioning the, the rise of kind of um identity politics and this kind of thing um one of the things to remember is that um I read it in the in the critical race theory book um by Delgado Delgado and uh, Stefancic that there's a kind of there's an alliance now between a strange kind of alliance between the woke culture, kind of the CRT theorists and Islam. It has a kind of, it has a strand, it has an, an Islamic kind of strand, which I find a curious, mm. a curious alliance, especially with the LGBT thing and everything like people have been saying. Um, now, one of the things that the CRT people did from the beginning is attack the First Amendment, right? 
So you were talking about the value of free speech. And one of the things that the CRT people do is they attack the First Amendment because in their estimation, the First Amendment gives greater power to people with, with what, what they perceive as a more powerful voice, right? A majority voice, white people. So for them, it's, um, I don't agree with it, but for them, it's, um, you know, it's the power to be racist. It, it empowers the racists. So they attack the free speech, the, the, the First Amendment by, you know, that's by definition what CRT theory, um, critical race theory does. Um, and, but one of the things about free speech, what they don't realize is that there would be no movement at all for political emancipation without free speech. 100%. It's, the corner, it's the cornerstone of every, of every freedom that we, every liberal um, privilege that we enjoy in Western societies. And without freedom of speech, uh, you know, the, 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 the right to protest um, is underpinned by, the, by, the, by freedom of speech by the rights of free speech. Um, Jordan B. Peterson has also said, I don't, I don't, again, I don't agree with everything he says, I, I think, but I think he's, he's great, he's fantastic on um, identity politics. And he says, it's impossible to have a conversation about anything political without causing offense. Like, it's, yeah. if, there's an, if there's an issue to be discussed by two people or more people in a room, two or more people in a room, if it's an issue in society to be discussed, it will necessarily cause offence, quote unquote, to somebody or other, right? So it's quite scary that we're coming down so heavily on, I mean, it's no wonder people have, people have mentioned, people have mentioned, you know, what is the cause? Why is, you know, why do people defend Islam? I think it's a perfect storm. There's so many things. There's Edward Said's Orientalism. There's, you know, there's, 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 the, there's the America's, escapades in the Middle East, you know, the wars and all kinds of stuff to consider. There's Noam Chomsky, there's, there's the left, there's the hard left. Um, but I think one of the things, you know, like, one of the things that's interesting is like, what chance have we got? If we can't, if we can't have a conversation about pronouns and mm. gender, what chance have we got having a conversation about something as divisive and exotic as, you know, Islam, uh, you know, uh, a minority religion in Western societies. Um, it's quite a scary prospect, actually. When people want to attack the First Amendment, it's kind of scary, actually, because I don't think they, they know not what they do, as the Bible would say, right? They don't realize the, the harm, actually, that they're, that they're doing, you know? That's, that's just my, that's my two pence worth. I, mean, I don't know what you think. I like it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I totally agree with you. And uh, that's why it's very important to keep on talking. Not don't don't let them silence us. I did not mm -hmm. leave Saudi Arabia to be silenced in America. Absolutely, absolutely. Ooh, I love that. Well said, Rada. Thank you so much, and thank you very much for choosing to not be silent on Forgotten Feminists and to share your story with us. We really appreciate it and appreciate thanks, your insight. Thanks, Yes, and thank you everybody for joining us here today. Thank and you everyone. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Take care everyone. Bye.